Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so, as mentioned, I I'm, uh, primarily investigate the practices and perceptions of the mixed process. Um, and more relevant to this, this talk and this event, uh, how objectively measurable signal properties relate to more uh, subjective impressions and intuitive terms that you might use to describe music production. So first off, given the audience and the nature of the event, I thought it appropriate to, allow, uh, to introduce the concept of mixing, um, mixing multi-source music more specifically. Uh, say you have a three-piece band, so you've got drums, bass guitar, and a uh, uh, grand piano, and a recording is being made of these uh, uh, instruments, of a performance on these instruments, rather. Uh, they are recorded separately, but then to later enjoy the results, uh, maybe in a lot, maybe live, but also later at home and so on, or broadcast. We need to do some fancy uh, expert signal processing to merge these different sources together in a musically pleasing way. And this is generally the, the process we refer to as mixing. So you might want to uh, bring out the bass a little bit, uh, widen the drums, uh, reposition the piano a little bit, move the bass guitar to the left, uh, add some depth and effects, uh, color and texture and so on, and box it up nicely uh, so that it's ready for uh, distribution uh, or whatever the sonic equivalent of this visual representation is. In in other words, we need to apply a range of specialized transformations on the audio um, that go under uh, various different names, I won't go into details, in order for the separately recorded sources uh, to form an enjoyable whole that we can all enjoy. So the state of the art in, in music production um, is uh, sadly that you cannot simply say make the guitar sparkle, if that's a thing uh, that you might want to do. Uh, the computer doesn't know how to handle this. Uh, instead, you have to be an expert operator who knows precisely what values of these uh, very esoteric parameters to enter in order to, in fact, use a sparkly guitar. So at this point, music technology has become uh, incredibly affordable and accessible uh, with very cheap hardware and software on the recording end, uh, which is very accessible to, to any musician who's not necessarily an expert sound engineer, and um, which in terms of uh, specifications rivals any of the most expensive studios in the, in the 1970s, for instance. On the distribution end, we um, um, also are spoiled for choice and of course through the internet there's a very direct and cheap connection between the musician or music producer and the listener. But anything in between, I mean you still sort of need this mixing process that I mentioned earlier to go from this recording to the distribution, at least if you want to make something that's more or less enjoyable. And by mixing I mean in the most general sense any processing in between these two points, so it could be editing, mixing, mastering. Um, there is generally a lot of resistance to the idea of, uh, of a, um, technology coming in and replacing part of an expert job, especially if that job is a creative one, a uh, creative task. And um, I would first like to put this into perspective a little bit by making a now quite popular analogy of music production with uh, photography, which I think is quite fitting because both of them are uh, a hybrid technical creative task. You manipulate technical expert parameters uh, in order to achieve creative goals that might be uh, informed by what the client wants, what the, the artist wants, and so on. Um, so in, phot in photography, uh, in contrast, we already take all of the uh, automation of the parameters, such as automatic focus, exposure, face detection, smile detection, uh, for granted. And this is great for amateurs because we can, we can take pictures without even thinking about it. Um, and we have all decent results without any expertise. And even for professionals, they might also leverage these automations and these uh, um, intelligence, if you will, built into their cameras. Um, because they can do things that increase speed, and even though they might tweak some parameters uh, based on their expert knowledge, they might get there faster. So the idea is, but this is something which is not 
really there yet, there are some, some exceptions, uh, is to do the automatic parameter setting uh, in music production um, so that the amateur indeed doesn't have to know the first thing about uh, the mixing process to get something which is decent enough for maybe a demo or a band rehearsal or a, a sound check. Um, and then the professional uh, can also use this to then get where they want to be enough faster. And of course they face increasing time and resources pressure, so this might be interesting as well. Um, so in photography, actually, taking the, met the metaphor, the, the analogy a bit more further, um, in photography, as in music, the rate at which content is being produced shows um, no signs of slowing down, where it has been estimated by some sources that in a particular year in the recent past, um, in that year, the same number of pictures were taken that were ever taken before in human history. Um, it's very hard to actually actually measure this, and uh, a more cynical person than myself might argue that the quality has gone down proportionally as well. Um, but even so, that actually increases the need, perhaps, for uh, technology to do this processing, because there's no number of experts can actually deal with uh, the number of content being pr uh, produced. So we need to do something in the technological space to, to make this more accessible to the musicians themselves, for instance. And if I can overextend the analogy a little bit more, um, it, automating these things doesn't necessarily mean taking away the control from the user. Uh, instead, the user can be given more intuitive, high-level controls. And in photography, the case of Instagram or similar apps comes to mind where the, um, the user doesn't think about contrast or exposure or focal length, um, but instead they pick a, a particular photographic era or um, photographic style uh, or technology. And in music, if you have an Insta mix, if you will, um, you might have a similar thing where you choose a famous engineer you would like to emulate, a particular musical genre for which this mixing style is fitting and so on. Um, so the idea of application which I'm working toward is that of the smart music production interface, um, where the user is, who's not able or not interested in translating their high-level ideas into low-level expert parameters, um, can actually interface with the computer in more intuitive, uh, layman, human-like uh, terms and language, um, where the parameters are indeed more semantic and perceptually motivated. And also, the um, traditional implementations and the modularity of the uh, recording studio and the different devices doesn't necessarily have to be respected. So, to give you an example of something which is already commercially available, actually, um, this device or this piece of software lets you control the intensity. Now, an expert engineer might have to use a cascade of different devices to actually achieve a general sense of intensity, uh, maybe in terms of frequency distribution or spatial positioning and so on. Um, but there's no reason for this uh, segregation of signal processing devices to exist if maybe you want to um, control a single perceptual attribute and then behind the scenes a computer can actually um, use all of these different devices. So, um, to conclude the introduction, the uh, future might look a little bit like this. You tell the computer, make the guitar sparkle. Um, the computer actually listens to what you're trying to manipulate. Um, it doesn't just blindly look up some values, and, uh, but it's actually uh, blindly or deftly, um, but it's actually listening and, uh, and reacting to, to the environment and the signals. And then it does a translation for you internally in terms of these expert parameters, and you might, in fact, get a sparkling guitar. So, what I would like to do for this talk is actually discuss two studies or, or projects which are kind of complementary in, uh, in the sense that they, um, to some extent, both achieve the same goal or work towards the same idea, uh, but they're very different in approach. Um, and I'll go into both of these. Um, 
first of all, here's approach zero, which I call uh, approach zero because computer scientists have very nerdy, but very good reasons for starting things uh, from zero onwards. But also because it's a bit of a non-approach and it's just basically to get things started. Um, it, it might be a bit naive, but this is sort of um, where, where I started things to get a feel of, uh, uh, of the general problem. So, when you look at practical audio engineering books um, telling you how to become a mix engineer um, and what you would need to learn and so on, so textbooks, um, a lot of them actually translate these terms that people would tend to use to describe music, such as uh, by its body, boom, bottom, boxiness, bright, brilliance. Um, they would translate them to frequency ranges, which are supposedly associated with that term. Uh, either a lack or excess or, or mere presence of energy in that frequency range would evoke that particular descriptor. Um, of course, this is quite vague. Um, it doesn't tell you anything about the, say, the shape of the, um, of the frequency spectrum or of the um, dependence on instruments or anything else. And it's just based on one person's opinion. So you would get um, uh, images like these and these books and this is where I source this from. So, um, a more quantitative scientific approach uh, was then followed and this um, is work that took uh, the whole of my PhD and I'm still working on, um, uh, on this pretty much. And it is the idea of the mix creation and evaluation where I had a group of subjects um, who were proficient mix engineers or at least studying to become them. Um, and they would mix the same song, so each of them would use a different mix. Then another group of proficient uh, engineers and listeners would listen to these mixes and evaluate them. And then the same thing would happen the other way around. And I think this is something which uh, benefits from a very quick demo. So in terms of the evaluation of the different mixes, um, which were made in a professional setting in, in their um, uh, preferred environment, so to speak, uh, rather than in a lab with, with two custom sliders, so, uh, so that it's maximally relevant to um, everyday music production. So this is an interface that they would get, and they could listen to different uh, mixes, and maybe you can as well, or maybe not. But also, and this is uh, the most important aspect for this talk, they could describe what they thought of these mixes. So maybe for mix number one, they could say, uh, the vocal is too loud here, the guitar sounds a bit boxy, uh, the drums are nice and bright, something like that. Um, so there we go. So this is basically the experiment um, that I did. And What's interesting now is uh, looking specifically at the comments that we find from this. So this is an actual comment that somebody gave on one mix of one specific song. Um, and basically the process that I followed was to chop this up in uh, more atomic statements describing different aspects of a certain mix. Um, so you get drums a little distant, vocal a little, a little hot, uh, lower mid-range feels a little hollow, and otherwise pretty good. So I uh, label these statements in terms of their instruments, in terms of the general feature that was being manipulated, um, as well as whether they were criticisms or um, compliments. And I did this 5,417 times, and now it's up. Uh, so this resulted in 13,000 uh, labeled statements, and we're still, still collecting them as we speak. Um, so this might call for automated transcription because, of course, it's a lot of work um, annotating all of this and analyzing all of this. But if you would take a look at some of the comments we got, um, and I challenge you to write software that could actually make sense of these, I think you need a human translator in this uh, situation. Why is the singer in the bathroom? <laughs> Where are the drums? One eight hundred drums. Long distance. Please come home in time for dinner. <laughs> so, uh, a very comical way of saying the drum level is too low, uh, which I'm sure you've understood. Is this is a drum solo album instead of a lead female group. 
in this case, the drums were too loud. And um, it goes on and on. Uh, <laughs> I think this, this was a particularly sarcastic school, but, um, uh, but these are the kind of comments that you get. And I guess one um, alternative to, um, to this and to make the, the processing and the data analysis more uh, uh, feasible or uh, more efficient would be to just give them check boxes or, or radio buttons and they could say uh, drums loud, drums quiet and so on. But this is precisely not what I wanted to do. I wanted to collect information on what uh, people's natural responses were to the different mixes and without making any um, assumptions about which words which vocabulary they might use. Um, so why comment specifically? Uh, basically understand what exactly is like and dislike in mixes. Um, also, if we're looking at how one should mix or how people mix, uh, and we're looking specifically at, say, uh, level balance, then it uh, could be interesting to disregard all of those mixes which were labeled as having not a very good level balance. Um, I also work from the hypothesis that there is no one perfect mix for a specific song, but there might be a range of different mixes within a certain uh, mix space, if you will. So um, having a mix where a lot of people said the vocal level is too high here, and then having a mix where a lot of people said it's too low, uh, that allows you to sort of zone in on the space of what an ideal vocal might be like, even if there is some margin of error that can be um, maintained. Um, it's also a practical uh, consideration to give the subject of the listening test the option to write some comments about different mixes, because otherwise you lose track on which mix is which. Um, and finally, and this is uh, reference to this talk, um, to require insight into the semantic sonic descriptors that people use to describe music and musical signal processing. And they could range from punchy, tight, blending, big, stuffy, and many, many more. Um, so this is one thing which uh, the comments also allow you to do, uh, to quantify the, um, the salience or the uh, amount of attention spent on the different instruments or indeed the different types of processing, uh, just in terms of what proportion of the comments related to that particular um, attribute or aspect. And also three out of four times you would actually get something which is criticizing uh, one aspect of the mix rather than praising it. Um, so, what, uh, when it becomes very interesting, uh, I think, is to take all of these comments and actually compare them to the objective, measurable signal quantities that, that, we, that we have been collecting. And this very complex graph, I'm going to walk you through it, uh, but show, actually shows the number of the songs, so these are the numbers at the bottom, so if you could bear with me. Um, just above there, it um, shows you which mix of that particular song is being considered. And um, the red bars and the blue bars show um, which mixes were allegedly too reverberant. Uh, so artificial reverber reverberation is a, um, an effect which is very often used in music production to enhance the general acoustics and spatial impression. Uh, of various instruments and mixes as a whole. So the red ones show you mixes where people said there's too much reverberation, and the blue ones were the ones where people said there's not enough, it's too dry, so to speak. Um, then at the same time, so this is just based on the comments, but then uh, actually measuring the loudness of the reverberation signal using um, a standardized uh, loudness measure from the uh, International Telecommunications Union. Uh, and those are the green axes. We actually saw that, um, as one perhaps might expect, you get a uh, relatively higher um, reverb loudness that you measure for those mixes where people said uh, there's too much reverberation, and a lower reverb loudness for mixes where people said there's not enough reverberation. Uh, so this is not a very spectacular result, but there were some interesting outliers uh, where this was not the case. And there were two categories, essentially. Uh, one, where people said there is a lot of reverberation, uh, despite us measuring actually a quite low reverberation level. 
these were ones where the reverberation was very long, had a very long tail. So it was still perceived as significant, even though the, the actual objective level wasn't very large. And then they, there was the converse of um, mix where people said, this mix is too dry, there is not enough reverberation, uh, despite us measuring quite significant reverberation levels. These were mixes where the reverberation was strong but decayed very quickly. So it wasn't really perceived as reverberation or, or as uh, being obnoxious at least. So at this point we uh, entered a uh, different feature into the mix, uh, so to speak, the uh, early decay time. And uh, this is a temporal feature which sort of quantifies the length of the reverberation, so the temporal characteristics. So indeed, we see that um, with uh, louder and longer reverb, you quite clearly see that people start to object to, le to the level of reverberation more and more. They start to say, this is definitely too much reverberation. And what's interesting, um, or what's the, the point of this exercise, is that you start to see um, the concept of a mix space that I referred to earlier, where indeed, after a certain point, almost all of the mixes are being called too reverberant, and below that point, uh, they are not reverberant enough. And this could translate into either uh, automated processing or at the very least some sort of uh, measurement or high level alert to a user of saying, well, this is too much reverberation or this, this is not enough. Um, so the mix space I was referring to. Um, bad examples might not be the, the right word to use here. I mean, all of the all the mixes we received were valid, very valued, but of course they, they do differ in quality and uh, uh, not all of the mixes we got were from Grammy winning engineers, although some of them were. Um, so we have to work with data which is um, not necessarily uh, an example of the perfect mix, uh, if such a thing even exists. But the point I want to uh, illustrate here is that we actually want to learn from this so uh, supposedly bad data, because the interesting mixes are the ones, or the interesting thing about this data set is that you get a whole spread of, for instance, differences in reverberation usage, and you start to see the boundaries of where things become accept, uh, not acceptable anymore and um, obnoxious and so on. So you sort of uh, map out the, um, the, the perception of a particular audio effect or of mixing as a whole. Um, we also uh, repeated this experiment at uh, various locations. Um, it's hard to I get a lot of questions about this, but it's hard to really say uh, Canada is different from the UK in this way, at least at this point with the analysis and the data that we um, considered so far. But what is interesting is that um, with all of the people that we've worked with, we have quite a breadth of expertise um, with in the Grammy, engineer, uh, Grammy winning engineers, as well as uh, complete layman managers. And uh, looking specifically at the comments, uh, one thing we did was to determine to what extent people tend to disagree with each other and how that might be a factor of, um, or how ex expertise might be a factor, or, or experience, if you will. And what we found was that um, with increasing experience, so going from amateur to student to professional, you actually get much more overlap in, um, in people's comments. So an agreement might be something um, or a case where someone says the vocal is too loud and someone else says yes, the vocal is too loud. Or uh, a disagreement might be something where um, people say there is not enough reverb and somebody else says there is too much reverb. Um, so rather than maybe have maybe amateurs having a certain preference and then professionals having a certain preference, this doesn't really seem to happen. But you see that there is a, a trend to come to a better consensus as people get more professional, and maybe they are more able to, um, or they they know better what is really expected of a mix in the commercial space. Um, as to how this might be of interest to uh, applications. Um, there is a, a very, this is a very uh, basic uh, effect processor which I have made, which will never make it to market because it's very naive. But the idea is that you enter a, a particular term, uh, for instance, muddy, 
a particular instrument, for instance, the vocal, and uh, what it does is then looking at all of the recordings or all the mixes rather well, um, that I've collected where people said the vocal is muddy and then all the mixes where people didn't say that subtract the um, spectral contour, uh, spectral qualities of both of, of, of all of these mixes um, and then taking the difference and using that as the underlying, um, uh, I call it EQ vector. So this is something else which uh, might benefit from a demo rather than my, uh, my talking about it. And this will be very quick as well, if at least, yeah. Regain control of my screen. So, for instance, we've got a little song here, and um, let's say we think the mix is muddy, let's see if it's not too loud. So, let's say the mix uh, is too muddy, so we look up what does it mean to be muddy. So I can make it more and more muddy. And this is something, this is what people think muddy sounds like, but if you agree. Uh, you can also do the inverse for Now it's very much not muddy, it's very clear that that's a descriptor you can use. On to the second part. So a different project with uh, with a very similar goal, at least in terms of connecting the subjective impressions and terms to more objectively measurable qualities and signal properties, is the um, SAFE project. Um, the idea is we have a lot of people, many more than I had in the previous study, uh, because it's based on software which we put online for people to use, and people actually do use it. Um, and as they use it in their usual sound engineering way, they also describe what they're doing. Uh, so they might say, uh, this signal I'm making brighter by turning these knobs like this, and here's how I make something more punchy, and so on and so on. Um, the idea being that in the end, uh, a user who doesn't want to set the parameters manually can just say, I want to make this bright, and the parameters will be set automatically um, because, the user, uh, because the computer, rather, is um, listening to the incoming audio and then looking it up in the database which we're accumulating. Um, the plugins look a little bit like this. And they're basically your basic uh, sound engineering plugins, which you will recognize if you've ever been a sound engineer. So you've got your basic controls here and visualization in the middle. But then the only thing that's odd, perhaps, is the little text, bo text box where you can uh, describe what you're doing. And then you can also do the uh, Converse, which is loading some of the descriptors which have been added to the database. Um, so, for instance, boomy, boost, bottom, um, and load that into your, your um, effects plugin. And you can add some metadata. And in the interest of time, I don't think I'll demo this because I hope this is um, pretty clear. Uh, it's basically a diagram uh, showing what, what I already said. I hope that's clear. Um, but the interesting bit for us, of course, uh, we're not just doing this to make uh, a plugin for people to use, but also to learn more about how, um, what terms people are using and um, how they relate to the signal properties, which we can actually measure and manipulate. So this graph is called the dendrogram, because it's essentially a tree, and it groups those terms which are most closely related to each other in terms of the measurable signal properties, which we're looking at. Um, there are many uh, possible signal properties you could look at, and we selected a set we thought was relevant. Uh, but for instance, what you see is that the words thin, clean, cut, click, and tin are actually quite similar to one contour associated with uh, different recordings. And this is based on the signal features. You could also uh, look at the specific parameters of the effects, um, which are esoteric and very implementation dependent. So for instance, for a, a reverberator, something which adds artificial reverberation, um, you see that turning up the density knob um, evokes the feeling of, in that order, big, huge, and massive. Um, so maybe quite a semantic control after all. Um, 
quite a few more interesting things which you can uh, read about in the associated papers. But at this point, I'd like to conclude to give my very um, personal uh, predictions for the, for the future of this uh, very niche but growing field, which is that we should get more data. And as we get more data to learn from, because this is all relatively minor in terms of scale, um, and definitely if you're considering the various countries where people might have different preferences and different languages and so on and so forth. Um, one initiative which I've been involved in um, towards getting more of this data is, um, for instance, the open multi-track testbed shown here, which is a database where people can uh, download and upload different uh, recordings, but also the mixes uh, associated with it and a lot of metadata. Um, and hopefully, once this gets snowballing, we can do a lot of interesting analysis there. And there's scope for artificial intelligence and machine learning, which generally uh, needs a lot of data. Um, also very interesting um, from our collaborators at Birmingham City University is the development of a web-based uh, music production tool, which if people are using it, we can also get a lot of data from, uh, not just in the little uh, effects plugin way, which I showed before here, uh, but this really encapsulate, encapsulates the whole mixing process, so it might also be a good uh, resource to learn from. And at this point, I hope there will be time for a few questions, and thank you very much.